man. Off to Children's Church. All right, well, this Wednesday night, our Wednesday night meal, which now starts at 5.45, um, is, was going to be spaghetti. You can uh, regular spaghetti, chicken spaghetti, pizza, zitza, anything else you want to make. Uh, please sign up here if you are able to, to do something or to bring something. Uh, we greatly appreciate that. And that's, uh, um, you know, that, that's, we don't do a lot of potlucks, you know, the, the traditional churches and stuff do, but uh, we do have that, that meal once a week because it allows us to, you know, leave work, come here, eat, and still attend church without having to worry about trying to get the kids fed, all these other kind of things. But it also doubles as a way for us to have fellowship together, to get to know one another, to become friends, to be family, because that's what we're supposed to be as a church family. So I would encourage you to attend, and, and if you can, help out, uh, make some food for that. Um, also, if, if you are... One of the people that, that likes to help with VBS, if you are uh, 
one of the people that is here regularly in the building. If, if you come to help serve the food, which I hope... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on a tangent. Can I go on a tangent? Okay. Wednesday night meals. I know there's a lot of you that help make food for that, but you know what? There's usually only two people to help serve it. And they do a great job, and they do a wonderful job, and they clean up afterwards. And they clean up after all of us who make our messes every Wednesday night. But, man, they could sure use some help. And so if you got, you know, if you want to, there's spots to help serve. There's spots to help clean on the sign-up sheet. Throw, throw your name on there. Help, help these ladies out because I know that they do uh, uh, week in, week out, day after day. You know, it just, and it's, it's get, it gets weary. You know, and, and so I would ask that uh, every now and then someone would jump in and, and give them a hand. But if you're going to be one of those people that's going to be in the building, we have these. And because of the daycare now, if anyone is in the building during daycare hours that has not been background checked, then um, the state can, can gig us for that. Um, and so if you are going to help with VBS, if you're going to help in, in uh, the nursery, if you're going to help in any things, we have to do a background check on you anyway. And so uh, it just happens that through the daycare, it's only $4 instead of $16. And so uh, we'll, we will have plenty of these sheets here. If, if you need one, they'll just be up here at the front. Um, and it usually doesn't take very long to get, to get those uh, accomplished and, and back. Um, and then uh, we, we, discussed, we were informed. Please don't sit on that, son. Uh, we were informed that uh, on Friday, that on Monday, which is tomorrow, um, the Chamber of Commerce is going to be here to do a ribbon cutting to, to officially, you know, welcome uh, the, the daycare into the community. And so if you'd like to be here at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning uh, and be part of that ribbon cutting ceremony, that will be going on tomorrow at, at 10. And so uh, we, we didn't uh, find that out until about Friday, uh, like late evening. Um, and so I apologize for the short notice on that. But um, other than that, I believe that is all the announcements that we have for right now. And so, ushers, if you'll come, please. Bow your heads with me. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for uh, once again allowing us to come into your house and to worship you. And, and Lord God, you know, as, as we were talking uh, with the worship team, Lord, there's just so much in this life that distracts us. There's so much in this life that, that wants to get in the way. Lord, while we are here, while we are in this place, help us to be singularly focused on you, Lord, that our hearts and our minds and our bodies would be involved in our worship, Lord, that it, that it wouldn't just be a simple going through the motions, that we wouldn't just mumble the songs and, and, and half-heartedly try to clap our hands, but Lord, instead that we would, we would worship you as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord God, that every part of our being, that every fiber of our being would be involved in our worship, Lord, that we would worship you in a way that would truly build a throne of praise for you, because, Lord, we know that, that you will come and attend this service with us if we put our hearts into it, if we put our, our minds into it, if we put all of who we are in it, because, Lord, you didn't say, come and worship me half-heartedly. You didn't say, you know, if you, if you got some of your strength and some of your heart and some of your mind, Lord, you said, worship me with all of your mind and all of your strength and all of your heart, and that's what we want to do, Lord. And so, Father, I ask that you would allow the 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 concerns of the week to fade away, that you would, that you would block out any worries about this upcoming week, Lord, that, that if anybody hasn't slept, they would be refreshed and renewed. And so, Lord, that, that this time of praise, this time of worship, Lord, would be powerful and it would be, and it would be something that, that glorifies you and that blesses you. Lord, we don't come here to get blessed, but we come here to bless you. You are an audience of one. And so, Father, I ask that you would allow us and help us to treat you in the way that you deserve to be treated. And we thank you in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come on, boy. Will you all go ahead and stand up with us, please?
Father God, Lord, what more can we say? This is, this is where we surrender. Lord, Lord it, it is not in our nature to surrender. Father God, we're, we're Americans, and even worse, we're Texans. And Lord, it, it makes us stubborn. It makes us pig-headed. It makes us think that we can do things by our own strength and our own power. And Lord, that, that's just not a reality. Sometimes being stubborn is, is a good thing. But tenacity can be taken too far. And, and Lord, we need to remember that we can fall back on you. The Lord, it's, it's, it's where we take our stand in your strength, in your might. Not in our own strength, but in your strength, Father God, do we truly find power. And Lord, as, as, as we go through the rest of this service, as, as we listen to what your word has to say to us, Father, I, I ask that we would remember that, that. That as we go to finish the things that you have set in front of us, as we go to, to live out the lives that you have given us to live, to run the race that you have set before us, Lord, that you would remind us, Lord, that, that while our tenacity can take us a, a certain distance, Lord, it is only through you and your strength can we truly persevere. And so, Father, I ask that, that, that you would pour your strength and your might and your power and your authority into us, Lord, that we would live lives that are glorifying to you. And we praise you for all these things in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen, amen. and amen. One thing I forgot uh, to mention during the announcements was I was asked a couple of times uh, about the, what I meant uh, last week when I, when I said that... Uh, uh, the folks that, that published those videos needed to repent. I wasn't saying that the people who shared those videos or the people that sent me those videos needed to repent. What I was saying was that the people that created those videos knowing they were lying needed to repent. I, it was nothing against the people that sent me the videos or anything like that. I just wanted to clarify that because a couple of people were, were a little bit concerned about that and, and I was not saying that in any way, shape, or form. It's just, uh, you know, when, when you purposely alter a map in order to make it fit your prophecy, then your prophecy is of you and is not of God, all right? And so th th that's what I was, I was speaking about. But anyway, today we are concluding a very long message series called Decisions, right? And I, and I want to point out that, that this message series is only this long because of Noah, right? This is Noah's fault. Because we, and when I, when I say that it's Noah's fault, it's because he was right when he pointed out that there was no way I could actually accomplish uh, what I wanted to accomplish in the time that I set to accomplish it. So therefore, it's clearly his fault, even though it has nothing to do with him and it's all on me. But uh, we're going to blame Noah anyway. Uh, but anyway, so uh, for the past several weeks, and by several I mean seven, um, we've been talking about the importance of the decisions we make because we know that the quality of our decisions directly affect the, affects the quality of our lives. The problem is, is that most of us are not very good decision makers, and that's why instead of waiting for the heat of the moment, waiting for the, 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 the passion or the, or, the, or the emotion of the moment, we are going to decide now, we're going to seek the wisdom of God, and through the word of God, we are going to decide now, we are going to pre-decide what actions we're going to take so that our lives are going to be glorifying to God. And so, as, you know, for the as, you know, every week we've been working with this phrase that says, whenever I'm faced with blank, because of the truth of God and because of, of what I value, I have pre-decided to do blank, right? We, we, be, because of, we, 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 let's face it, we all know what our blanks are, right? We know where we're weak. We know where we're strong. We know what we struggle with. We know what we don't. And so before we get into those situations, since we know we're going to end up there at some point, we're going to pre-decide what actions we're going to take. When we're faced with this, we're going to pre-decide that we're going to do that. And we've been looking at six specific areas that, that, we're, uh, that, that we're making pre-decisions in because these six areas directly affect our uh, earthly lives but they also directly affect our relationship with God. And these six areas are consistency, devotion, generosity, faithfulness, readiness, and finishing. And today we're going to talk about being finishers, right? We're finishing the series, and so we're going to talk about being finishers. And, and, and specifically, I want to talk to those of you who are thinking about maybe giving up, right? You, you've been pressing through, pressing in, and all this kind of stuff, and and and. You're thinking maybe it's just time to quit. Maybe it's just not for you, right? <clears throat> You've taken on some of the challenges of this pre-decision stuff, but especially after like last week's message, it's a lot harder than what you thought it was going to be. 
And, and you're just ready to give in. You're ready to throw in the towel. And you know, some of y'all that have come and talked to me, what's funny is, is some of y'all are not struggling as much with some of the spiritual things as you're struggling with making this pre-decision stuff happen in, in, in the natural, right? Yeah, and, and so as you've been working through some of these natural things, you, you're feeling like quitting on them just as much as you feel like quitting, or maybe even more so, on, is quitting on the spiritual things. And, and you know, it's like maybe at one point in time you had a goal in life. Maybe you had a dream. Maybe you had a vision for your life. Man, this is how you thought it was going to go. And, and, and then, you know, you started it out with great anticipation, but then you hit some resistance and you stalled out. And maybe that lack of progress caused frustration and it caused some discouragement. Things slowed down and it looked like you weren't going anywhere. And, and well, now, now because of that, you just, you just want to quit. You just want to get, why am I still trying if I'm not getting anywhere? Right? Maybe there was a relationship that, that you wanted to restore, but when you reached out, things didn't go so well. Maybe you're fighting for your marriage or, uh, you know, and you're doing everything that like, you feel like you can do, but man, you're at the end of your rope and there's just nothing you can seem to do to make things work. Maybe you've been praying for a miracle. Right? Maybe, maybe you've been praying for your child or your spouse to get saved. May, maybe you've been praying for a healing or you've been praying for, for some financial position or, or you've been asking God to help you overcome an addiction or, or, or you've, you've tried and you've prayed and you believed. If, and, and man, no matter what it is, the results just aren't there for you. And so now you're discouraged and you're losing hope. And as I said today, the, what I want to talk about is I want to talk about being a finisher. And so I'm going to start off by asking you a question. Actually, I'm going to ask you three questions that are basically the same question. So, you know, I'm just going to be repetitive for no reason. Uh, so uh, the, the, the question is, though, is what do you think separates average people from amazing people? What, what do you think separates those people who have really fulfilled lives to those who kind of just feel empty and dead inside? What, what do you think the difference is between those who, who are massively successful and those who struggle to succeed. Well, as I've done in, in previous weeks, I'm going to tell you what it's not first, right? The difference between these things is not their education level, right? The difference between these things is not their intelligence level. The difference between those that are successful and those that are not is not how good they look. It's not their talent. It's not who they know or, 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 or what they know. The difference between those that live lives that are kind of meh and those that live lives that are amazing, it's their perseverance, right? It's their perseverance. As, as I was praying, I talked about tenacity, I talked about stubbornness, but you see there comes a point in, in life where, where, you know, people don't even try, right? Here, we, we're a little bit stubborn here, especially y'all, because I know you, but, uh, you know, uh, we're a little bit stubborn here, and so we got some perseverance, we got some tenacity built into us, but you see, those that are not getting anywhere in lives, those are usually people that aren't even trying. And when the tough times hit, instead of when the going gets tough, the tough get going, well, these guys, when the, tough, when the going gets tough, the, they get going in the opposite direction, right? Their willingness to stick it out, it's their grit, their drive, it's a flat-out refusal to quit that makes the difference between those that struggle and those that succeed. In fact, there's, there's an author, and uh, she, she writes business books mostly, and, and, but her name is Angela Duckworth. And she has this groundbreaking research that she did on why successful people are really successful. And, and she looked at business leaders. She looked at military leaders. She looked at teachers that teach in very difficult situations. She looked at fifth graders who can spell words in the dictionary bigger than most adults can spell. And she asked a set of questions. And, and uh, you know, she, what she tried to find out was what are the qualities that separate the super successful from the average? And the number one top quality that she identified was what she called grit, right? It's what she called grit. And, and she defined grit as the strength of character that refuses to quit. She said that it's, it, it's their willingness to stay in the fight. It's the strength of character that refuses to quit. And, and one of my favorite quotes from her book says, uh, enthusiasm is common, but endurance is rare. As in a lot of people like to get start. A lot of people like to get going, but very few people like to finish. And that's why today we're going to pre-decide that we are finishers. Because by nature, we tend to take the easy way out, right? It's human nature to be a lot like water and follow the path of least resistance. 
If things get difficult, our society teaches us that, well, you know, the best thing to do is to blame others and then quit, right? Our, our society teaches us that, that we can blame others, we can blame our circumstances, we can call it a disability, we can claim to be a victim, and then we quit. And so our decision today is going to be this. We're, we're going to pre-decide that when I commit, I don't quit, right? It rhymes, and so it's easy to remember. When I commit, I don't quit because I was created in God's image, and just as he is a finisher, I am a finisher. And normally I don't ask you guys to repeat things after me, but I want you guys to say this out, out loud with me this morning, all right? So say it with me. Like the God who created me in his image, because you're created in God's image, I am a finisher, and therefore when I commit, I don't quit. Well, the greatest non-quitter in the New Testament, besides Jesus, was the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul says this. He says, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Right? Paul said, <clears throat> you know, I mean, he didn't say, Paul actually uh, had basically every reason to quit, Right? Now, now, he says, I'm not going to quit. He says, I, I, I'm, I consider my life worth nothing as long as I can finish the race. But he had every reason to quit. Paul was shipwrecked. He was snake bit. He was, he was beaten. He, he, he was stoned to death. And you've heard me talk about that before. Paul was stoned to death three times. Most people get stoned to death once, right? Paul was stoned to death three times. He was arrested multiple times. He had to fight lions in the arena. When you think of the Apostle Paul, do you think of a gladiator? Because you should. Because he had to fight lions in the arena. In 2 Timothy, Paul says this. right? He, Paul, in 2 Timothy, let me set up the stage for you. T uh, Nero is the emperor at this point, right? And Nero, one of his hobbies is burning Christians alive as, ca as candles at his, at his garden parties. This is, this is something he really enjoyed. And, and, and Paul has just discovered in 2 Timothy that Nero has now sentenced him to death. He's going to be beheaded. And he's been dropped into this sewer, right? He's awaiting execution. And the, the part of the dungeon that, that Paul is in is, is actually nothing more than, than a, a, a sump. It's a, it's a pit where they run the sewer. The Romans invented plumbing. And they have a sewer. And a lot of people died waiting execution because they're living literally waist deep in sewer, and so Paul is being kept in this sewer, and he writes to his son in the faith, Timothy, and he says, but you should keep a clear mind in everything. Don't be afraid to suffer for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry that God has given you. Now, can I just tell you something that if you're going to be a finisher in anything in life, you're going to suffer something, right? Right? If you're going to be a finisher at anything, especially spiritual things, you're going to have to suffer something. I mean, it's a different sermon, but you've heard me preach it before. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you don't have hard times, right? Being a Christian doesn't mean it's all going to be sunshine and lollipops. In fact, in many ways, being a Christian guarantees that you're going to have hard times. But Paul says, no matter what, fully carry out the ministry that God has given you. In other words, what he's trying to tell us is, is you know, when you commit, don't quit. Finish what you start. Paul says, as for me, my life is already poured out like an offering to God. The time of my death is near, and I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Or, or depending on your translation, I have remained faithful. He says, I've been in the battle. Right? He says, I've been in the battle, and I've wanted to quit. I've wanted to give up, but I haven't given up. I fought the good fight. I remained faithful even when I wanted to quit, even when I thought it was overwhelming, even when I couldn't go any further. I, I remained faithful because God helped me to stay faithful. And, and this is the powerful part that you need to hear, and this is, this is what I want you to hear this morning, and this is what you need to hear this morning. Paul had finished his race, but you have not finished yours. All right? Paul had finished his race, but you have not finished yours. I don't care how much you've failed. I don't care how many times you've fallen down. I don't care how many times you've given up and quit in the past. The fact is, is that you still have breath in you, and thus your race is not finished. You still have more to do. All right? God has more for you this morning. You may find yourself discouraged. You may feel, feel like giving up and giving in. But I believe that, that God is saying to you today that if you're not dead, he's not done. All right? 
There's more for you. God's got more plans. God's got more assignments. There's, there's, there's more for you to do. There's more people to love. There's more people to help. There's more ministries to, to start. There's more ministries to advance. There's more things that you need to be taking part of. There. There's no more businesses to launch. There's more content to create. There's more hope to share. There's more friendships to make. There's more addictions to break. God has more for you. And so if you are not dead, then you are not done serving him in his kingdom. There's more for you to do, and since there is more for you to do, what do you do with that, right? Well, you fully finish the work that God gave you to start, right? I mean, this is a big concept. You, you, you fully finish the work that God has already given you to start. And, and I know that some of you all have already told me, it's like, John, I'm, I'm not just tired, but I'm tired, right? You tired, Beverly? <laughs> Beverly's like, I'm tired of this sermon. Or, no, I... I don't know about you, but there's a point where I stop being tired and I start to get tired, right? It, 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 my, my drawl comes out and I'm not even from Texas. I didn't even know I spoke with the drawl until I went home for dad's funeral and then suddenly everybody's making fun of me and I had no idea what they were talking about. So, Anyway, what I, I like what David Allen had to say in his book, his, his book called Getting Things Done. He said, much of the stress that people feel doesn't come from having too much to do. It comes from not finishing what they started. Right? And I, I don't know who this is for, but man, I know I'm speaking to some of y'all right now because, man, that spoke, that, that spoke a lot to me. And, 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 I, and that, I mean, that's just a powerful quote, quote because some of the stress that you feel isn't because you got too much to do. It's because you haven't done what God has told you to do. Right? God told you to do something, and, and maybe you started it, maybe you didn't, but the stress you're feeling isn't because you're overwhelmed with too many things to do. It, the problem is, is you're overwhelmed with the fact that you haven't done what God has set in front of you to do. And so what I, want you, what I want you to do for the next few minutes, I want you to kind of take a posture of prayer, an attitude of prayer. As, as, as I'm going to continue preaching a little bit, I want you to also be praying in your mind. Listen for God's voice as you're listening to my voice, because uh, they're different. Um, but, you know, if you've got to close your eyes, close your eyes. Don't go to sleep. But, you know, if you've got to close your eyes, close your eyes. But take the next few minutes in an attitude of prayer and simply pray, God, show me what you want to show me. Right? Show me what you want to show me. And again, I just want you, want you to keep your, your mind focused on, on, on prayer and, and hearing from the Lord. Um, but I want you to start thinking about, man, what have I started that I haven't finished? And, and, and I'm not talking about, you know, well, I haven't finished binge watching the third season of Stranger Things, right? That, that's not what I'm talking about here, okay? Uh, I, I, what I'm talking about is that God has prompted you to do something that you've not done. Or maybe you did get it started, but you, you, but you didn't get it finished. And, and I'm going to read some scripture to you, and then I'm going to ask the question to you again, but in a, in a different way. Revelations 3, Jesus says, I know your deeds, that you have a reputation for being alive, and yet you are dead. Be constantly alert and strengthen the things that remain, which are about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Do you ever feel like that, church? Hey, have you ever felt like that? Uh, on the outside, man, you, you look like you're a strong Christian. You look like you're just going all, all out for God. But on the inside, you actually know you're not doing what God has called you to do. Jesus said, wake up. He said, wake up. You didn't finish what I called you to do. Wake up and get with it. And as you prayerfully listen to, to the word of God, what unfinished business, what unfinished assignment did God bring to your mind in that moment? As a follower of Jesus Christ, what were you prompted to do? You were prompted to do something, so admit to yourself what that thing was. What is your unfinished assignment? What is it as a follower of Jesus that you know you're supposed to do, maybe you were going to do, you hoped to do, you thought about doing it, but for some reason you didn't do it? You knew you were supposed to do something or give something or reach out to someone. You, what is that one thing that you were supposed to do? You know, maybe it's more than one thing. Maybe it's a number of different things. Maybe it was a big thing. Maybe it was a little thing. Maybe it was a lifelong assignment. Maybe it was just a one-time task. Maybe you were supposed to heal a broken relationship, but you decided not to reach out to that person because you were afraid of, of getting rejected. Maybe you were supposed to share your faith, but you hesitated. Maybe you're supposed to give a special offering, but man, that, the amount that God was asking for just seemed like too much at the time. Maybe it was something less spiritual, but maybe God had a purpose for it you didn't know about. Maybe you're supposed to finish that degree that you started. Maybe you're supposed to find a, a place of rest and start a hobby. 
Maybe you were supposed to join the kitchen staff like we talked about during the announcements and, and help serve food on Wednesday nights. Maybe you're supposed to be in the nursery rotation. Maybe you've been given a gift to use right here in the church and you've never followed through on that. Maybe you were supposed to work in ministry or start a business or apologize to someone or start eating right and exercising. Maybe it was something spiritual, maybe it's, it wasn't, but there's unfinished business that God has called you to, but you haven't followed through. And I love the advice that the Apostle Paul gives on this. He, in, in Corinthians, he, you see, the Corinthians, they were going to give a big offering. They had promised Paul, hey, we're, we're going to support you for like a couple of years. We're going to give you all this money. We're going to do all these things. And, and, and they, they started to, but then they didn't follow through. And this is Paul's advice on this. And, and he says, I, I give this advice. It is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you must complete the doing of it. That there was a readiness and a desire to, to start it so that there may also be a completion out of what you have. He said, man, you, you should finish what you started. It was a good thing that you wanted to start, but man, it was a bad thing when you didn't finish it. You, you need to be a person of your word. You need to finish what you started. And so you have to ask yourself, what is that unfinished business? What is it that God has told me to do that I haven't finished yet? And you may ask, it's like, well, you know what? What is the big deal if I don't do it? What, what, what's the big deal if I quit? I mean, it wasn't even a spiritual thing that God prompted me to do. I mean, why does God care if I go to the gym or not? Why does God care if I do this thing or that thing or not? Why does God care if I get a degree or not? So you know, what does it matter? It wasn't even spiritual what he told me to do. But what you have to understand is that what doesn't seem like a big deal to you may be a big deal to God, right? You don't know what God was going to do with what he had planned for you to do. There are some things that are divine assignments. There are divine appointments that really have nothing to do with you. Or maybe they did. Maybe God was going to use these things that you didn't know about to advance you or to prosper you or to grow you spiritually. Or maybe it really had nothing to do with you, but he was going to use those things to advance and grow and, and prosper someone else. See, God can do things in, in ways that you can't possibly imagine. But when you don't step out and do what he called you to do, then those things don't get done. Another reason it matters if, if you quit is because every decision you make is actually you voting towards your own future, right? Every time you decide in the moment, you're basically voting about what kind of person that you're going to be. Your decisions or the decisions that you make, make you. And whenever you decide to quit, what you're doing is you're voting and you're saying, nope, I really don't have what it takes, I really don't, I'm really just not the kind of person that's a finisher. I'm actually kind of a quitter. That's the vote that you're taking. On the other hand, when you stand strong in the Lord and you persevere and you don't back down and you don't finish, or, and, and you do finish, then you're voting, hey, I am a finisher. And through the power of God, not my own strength, but through the power of God, I get things done. See, you're making a statement in the natural and in the supernatural saying, I persevere. And when I commit, I don't quit. I am a finisher. A pastor I know, he told a story, and this is not my story, so I'm, I'm borrowing it from a buddy of mine. But he, he, he said, you know, John, he says, I need to tell you how I got to college. He said, when I was a senior in high school, I, I, I played tennis. That was my sport. He says, I played tennis, and, and I was in a tennis tournament. And he says, I'll be honest with you, I was only a, an average player. He said, I was an average player, and I knew there was going to be scouts there that day. And I got up there, and my very first match was against a kid that had been undefeated state champion for like three years running. He, this, this kid was just awesome. He was great. There, there, nobody could touch this kid. And he says, I went out there and I wiped the floor with him. He said, I beat him in straight sets. I played the match of my life. Nothing else mattered. He said, it was bizarre how great I was that day. He says, there was a scout in the stands. He came down and he signed me on the spot. He said, I got my, I got my, I got my full ride to college right then and there. And, he's, and he said, it was great. He said, the problem was, is I still was just that average player. He said, so when I got to college, I was the worst player on the team. He said, not only was I the first player on the team, in my first tournament, I got skunked. He said, I didn't, I didn't score a single point the entire day. And he said, by the end of the day, I had smashed all my rackets on the ground. I was cussing, I was screaming, and I stormed out, and I went in my dorm room, I locked the door, and I refused to come out. He said, my coach was knocking on the door. I, I called him a bunch of names through the door, sent him on his way, and he says, but my, high, my college coach called my high school coach, and my high school coach drove three hours to come and talk to me. 
He says, he knocked on the door, and he says, since I knew he wasn't supposed to be there, I opened the door, and, and he looked at me, and he says, huh, so this is the kind of person you are, huh? He said, I never imagined that you were a quitter. He says, this is a big day in your life. It's not because of a tennis tournament. He says, today's a big day because you're going to determine who you're going to be for the rest of your life. And he said, you know, you need to decide what kind of person you are. Are you a person that quits or are you a person that overcomes? He said, then his tennis coach got up and he walked out. The man drove three hours each way for less than a 10-minute conversation. But he said that 10 minutes was all it took because uh, he says, I kept playing. I kept playing. He says, that first year, not only did I keep playing, but I kept losing. And then my second year, he says, I, I got a little bit better, but, and so I was losing less, but I was still losing. He said, but my, my third year, I was actually a nationally ranked player, and by the end of the fourth year, I won athlete of the year at my university. And he said, it was all because my coach told me this one line. He says, I don't care if I see you struggle, just never let me see you quit, right? I don't care if I see you struggle, just never let me see you quit. And I believe that that's what God is saying to some of us today. He's like, it's okay for you to struggle. It's okay for you to be going through some difficult times. It's okay for you to not be happy with it. It's okay for you not to be Mr. Joy Joy happy happy all the time. It's okay for you to struggle, just never let me see you quit. Because you see, God is never going to quit on us. And one of my favorite verses in the Bible is the one that we saw at the beginning of the message where Paul said, I consider my life worth nothing. Right? I consider my life worth nothing to me as long as I can finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus Christ has given me. And there's a little phrase in there that, that I think that, that a lot of us miss the true meaning of. Right? You know, why was Paul able to finish this race? It's because he wasn't running it for himself. Right? He said, I consider my life worth nothing. It's not about me. It's not about my desires. It's not about my dreams. It's not about my 401k. It's not about my popularity. It's not about how many views or how many followers I get. I consider my life worth nothing to me as long as I finish the task that Jesus has given me. See, if you're, if, if you're quitting what God has called you to start, then maybe it's because you care about something more than you care about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know it's kind of a heavy statement. But you know what? If, if you're quitting it, God has called you to start, then maybe it's because you care about something more than what you care, than you care about running the race that God has set in front of you. Right? And since your life isn't on the line like Paul's life was, then maybe you need to rewrite this verse a little bit for you. And you need to say, you know what? I consider my personal comfort worth nothing that I may please Jesus and finish his race. Or maybe I, I consider my net worth worth nothing if only I may please Jesus. I consider the opinions of other people and what they say about me worth nothing if only I may please Jesus. I consider my social media following worth nothing if only I may please Jesus. I consider my personal hopes and dreams worth nothing if only I may finish the race that God has called me to run and I can glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever that thing is, whatever that, that thing that, that would try to exalt itself above God in your life, that, that thing that makes you want that more than you want Him, Maybe that's, that's why you're not finishing the race that was set in front of you. It's because you've got your values out of order. You see, when we commit to Jesus, when we make him Lord of our life, we're not just accepting his forgiveness so that we can get into heaven and we don't have to go to hell, right? We're giving him our lives so that he can glorify himself by living through us. And thus you don't run your race for you, you run your race for God. And, and then here's what you, what you do. All right? if, if you want to finish what you've started, if, if you've started and you haven't finished and you want to finish, you want to be that finisher, then the next step is taking the next step. Right? The next step is taking the next step. Wh whatever the next step is for you, you take the next step and then you take the step after that and then you take the step after, after that. You know, if you want to finish what you started, you have to pick up where you left off and you have to keep on going. And the great news is you don't have to finish your race today. Right? You just have to take the next step. When you look at the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, you notice he didn't do it all in one day, right? He didn't start his ministry and end his ministry on the same day. No, it took him three and a half years, right? And he did it one step at a time. 
faithfully pushing forward in the good times and in the hard times, in the praise and in the persecution. He ran his race one step at a time, always moving forward. And then once that he was at the end of his race, he was hanging on the cross, and there he said, it is finished. And the Greek word there is tetelestai. I hate that. Tetelestai. And in context, this, this word could actually have several different meanings. But in the context of this term, it's a business term that means the debt is fully paid. Right? In, in other contexts, this can be the uh, term that means the end of hostilities in a war. It can be the ends of negotiations uh, at the beginning of a contract. But in this contract, it is the end of the contract. In this context, it's the end of the contract. It's the end of business. The contract is complete. All the terms have been met, and the debt is fully settled. As in Jesus' death on, on the cross settled all the debts of all of mankind. Jesus said, It is finished. I have completed everything that I was sent to do. I have finished the race. Day by day, week by week, month after month. Painful moment after painful moment. Jesus just kept taking the next step, right? When, when they hated him, he took the next step. When they loved him, he took the next step. When they struck him on the cheek, they he took the next step. When he was carrying the cross up the hill and he fell to the ground three different times, he got back up and he took the next step. And then when hanging on the cross, when they spit at him and mocked him and, and shamed him, he just took another step and said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. From the moment he started his ministry, Jesus had predecided, I am always ready, I'm always consistent, I'm always devoted, I'm always generous, I'm always faithful, and when I commit, I don't quit because I am always a finisher. This entire series that we've been going through has come down to this one topic. Week after week, for the, for, we've looked at six areas of decision making, and we look at these things because when we do these things, these six things, we become more like our Heavenly Father, and we become more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Right? If we, if we do these six things, we will be more like Him. And, and as Christians, that was, that's what we're supposed to be, right? If we're truly followers of Jesus Christ, then we will want to be more like Him. We will, we will begin to be a reflection of Him. We will begin to do the things that He does. And, and, and it means that we will be living out our predecisions and we will walk the way Jesus walked. And so as you sit there and you think about whatever it is that you haven't finished, the question becomes, what are you going to do with that? The trajectory of human nature is what's towards what's easy. It's towards what's convenient. And the devil's going to try to get you to quit, right? The devil's going to try to get you to quit what you were called to start. And so, you know, the, the final challenge of all this is that you pre-decide when you commit, you don't quit. Right? You, you're you're going you're gonna to say one more prayer. You're going to read one more chapter. He, even, though it's a, even though it's difficult, you're going to press on and you're going to press in and you're going to keep on going. You're going to ask for forgiveness and you're going to offer forgiveness to those that don't even ask you for it. You're going to run one more mile. You're going to reach out to someone one more time. You're, you're going to memorize one more verse. You're going to take one more semester of classes. You're going to show up at that horrible job with that horrible boss one more day. And you're just not going to hit them. When you get knocked down, you're going to get back up one more time. You're, gonna, you're not going to stop running your race just because your race got hard. Right? Instead, you're going to start running your race. Instead of running it for you, you're going to start running it for him. And you're going to be like Paul, and, and you're, you're going to be running it for God, and you're going to be running it in God's strength instead of your strength. You're going to take another step and another step and another step. And when you don't have the power or strength to take another step, you're going to call out to your heavenly father for his strength and his might and his power. And then you're going to take another step. And it's going to be the biggest step you've ever taken because now you're doing it in his strength instead of your strength. In the Barcelona Olympics, it, there was a British athlete. His name was Derek Hammond. And, and he was the favorite to win the 400 meter race. And man, he got off to a good start. He was out there, he was booking it, right? But midway through the race, he ruptured his hamstring and he fell to the ground. Every Olympic dream he had was crushed, right? No, knowing right then and there he did not have what it took to finish the race, he cried out. In one of the most emotional moments in sports history, his dad came down out of the stands and basically carried his son to the finish line. And what you've got to understand is that when you run your race for God, you don't run it alone, all right? You never run alone. Because God has promised he who has begun a good work in you 
will not fail to complete it. Our God will always carry you through. Our God will always help you finish what you start as long as you keep taking another step. And so why is it that so many people quit? Why do so many people quit on their marriages or, or quit on their dreams or, or quit on their relationships with God? Well, the simple reason is, is because in their mind, quitting was an option, right? But, but what if we eliminate quitting as an option? What if when God calls us to an action or a ministry or, or an act of generosity or even an act of righteousness and living righteously for him, what if quitting were not an option? But instead we say, you know what? If, if God is for us, who can be against us? What if instead of walking away and quitting on God, we run our race for him and through his might and through his power? What if we gave him our doubts and our fear and our anxieties and our disappointment and, and when it's too much and when it's too hard and, and we want to give up and we want to give in, instead of quitting, we say, you know what, Lord, I don't understand. I don't want to keep on going. This hurts more than I can bear, but I'm not going to let go. I'm going to cling to you and I'm going to cling to the gospel because you are the author and the finisher of my faith. And, and like you and through you, I am not a quitter. Instead, I am a finisher. Amen. And I know we're not always able to control certain circumstances and sometimes other people quit on us and, and we have no choice in the matter. And you know, I mean, you can't stay in a marriage when the other person's already left and, and you can't excel at a job when the company's already been shut down, right? But, but in, in every situation where you have a choice, what if we eliminated quitting as an option and instead we run the race that God has set before us and instead of running it in our power, we run it in his power. Right? As long as we have breath in us, as long as I have breath in me, I have business that needs finished. Because the God who created me in his image is a finisher, and so am I going to be. And so, Father God, Lord Jesus, I, I pray that, that your Holy Spirit would do a deep work in our church. Lord, that, that you would do a deep work in, in our church as a whole and that you would do that work in us as individuals. I would ask God that, that, that we would open ourselves up to what you have to say to us. That what unfinished business, Lord God, that do we have? Prompt us, remind us, bring it. Don't, Lord God, don't just, Lord, your word promises us the still soft voice, but Father God, I ask that it would be turned into a shout. Lord, I ask that, that, that in our minds, Lord, we would we would not be able to shut it off, that we would always be hearing it. And Lord, by, by the power of your word and the truth of your spirit, Father God, that you would empower us to be faithful to run the race that you have set before us. And God, I pray that just, just like Paul, that we might have the blessing at the end of our life, that we would be able to say, I ran a good race. I've, I've kept the faith. God, help us to be faithful today. Help us to take the next step in our race so that we would honor you and bring glory to your name. Lord, help us to let go of the things that, 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 that would glorify ourselves. Instead, Lord God, help us to only pursue the things that would glorify you. You know, and as we talk today, I wonder how many of y'all would say, that, yeah, something came to mind. You know, when, when, when you were talking, something, God brought something to my mind and, and, and it's something that I need to follow through on. And, and, and if God brought something to your mind, if there's something you need to work on, would you just raise your hand for me? Thank you, thank you. Yes, all over the room, thank you. Yeah. You know, it, it, if you want to message me with it, if you're watching online, yes, thank you. Man, this is something I think we've all faced. I know I, I'd have to raise my hand in that. There's still work that needs finished. And if you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to take you back to, to that statement Jesus made on the cross when he said, it is finished. When Jesus said, it is finished, he said that because the debt for sin had been paid in full. And what I want you to understand here this morning is that it wasn't a debt that, that was owed to Satan. It was a debt that was owed to God. You need to understand that the debt of sin is not owed to Satan. It is a debt that is owed to God. And God knew that man could not pay that price. And so God sent, that, sent his one and only son to pay that price for you. Jesus was born into a man. He lived perfectly so that he could become that perfect sacrifice, which was the only way the debt could be paid. And, and I want you to understand that it's a debt that we all owe and that we all have owed. Not one of us here can say that, that we are deserving to go to heaven on our own merits. We've all sinned and all fallen short of the glory of God. And, and, and you know, we've all been places we shouldn't be. And Jesus paid that debt. And today I want to make an opportunity for you to make him the Lord, give you an opportunity for you to make him your Lord and Savior. 
You know, when you make Jesus your Lord, you're not just saying, okay, I want to get out of hell free card. What you're saying is that I want to make you Lord of my life. I'm giving my life to you. I'm surrendering my life to you. And surrender doesn't come natural and surrender doesn't come easy. But I'm, Lord, I'm going to give it to you. And I'm going to allow you to live my life for me. And if that's you this morning, or maybe, maybe you've done that a long time ago, but somewhere along the line you got messed up and you need to restart that. If either of those things are you this morning, would you raise your hand for me so I could, I could pray with you? Is there anybody? Okay. Well then, Father, as we go into a, a one last worship song, Father, we just ask, Lord, that, that you would quicken in our hearts and our minds what it is that you would have us do. And Lord, as I've already prayed, I ask, Father God, that you would never let us let go of it, that, you would never, that, that it would never leave our minds, that it would become that thought that just dominates. Lord, it would, it would be worse than a song that we can't get out of our head, but Lord, it would be a thought that dominates every other thought, that Lord, it, it, it would take over our lives until we begin to live our lives fully and wholly devoted for you. Lord, help us to truly be decision makers. Decision makers, that every decision is predecided that we would bring glory to you with every thought, with every word, and with every action. In the name of your Son, our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. We're going to stand and sing one more song, and if you need prayer for anything this morning, I invite you forward to come and pray with us. So please stand with us for one last song.
God, once again, we, we want to praise you and glorify you for your presence in this place, Lord. Lord, that, that you never fail on your word, that where two or more are gathered, then your spirit is with us also. And, and Lord God, that, that your, your word never fails us, that, that, you will be, that you began this work in us, and you're going to be faithful to complete it under the time of Christ Jesus. And so, Father, even if we have to go through the rest of our lives taking that next step, I just ask, Father, that you would remind each and every person that they do not walk alone that you are always with them, that you always are, are going to be there for them. And, and Lord God, when, when they don't want to go any further, Father, just like the, the man in the Olympics, that you pick them up and you carry them. Lord, and I just ask that you watch over everybody here, watch over those that couldn't be with us this morning, bring us all back together on Wednesday night, that we may fellowship together and that we may come and learn more about you, that we continue to glorify you in this place and out of this place. And we thank you and we praise you in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. Go with God.